solution is a debt. Every single solution, how regardless how beautiful it is, how elegant it is, it's a debt. Because you need to evolve it, you need to make it better, you need to enhance it. So by by thinking back to the first principles, you always can challenge the solution and make sure that you're always having a solved problem. Welcome to another episode of Data Masters. I'm Anthony Dayton, Chief Product Officer at Tamer. My guest today is Ella Halal. She is Shopify's Director of Data, as well as an Adjunct Assistant Professor at the University of Waterloo, a data scientist, and an evangelist for women in technology. Today, we'll talk to Ella about why questioning conventional wisdom is often at the heart of good data science why it's critical to have an always learning mindset, and how her team is playing a crucial role in the growth and revenue at Shopify. Ella, welcome to Data Masters. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Excellent. So, you know, before we get into the details of of Shopify, uh, I'm sure people would love to know a bit more uh, about your personal background uh, and you know what stops you've made along the way in your career and life uh, that land you in the current position you have uh, at Shopify. Um, I started my career actually as a software developer. I was a Java software developer um, and grew into like a full stack. Um, I also did my master's and my PhD in pattern analysis and machine intelligence. And then I took it from there, like uh, one job after the other, growing into my career, uh, getting too deep from the middle, then started leading a team, moving into um, a manager role, then a like director role. Um, so prior jo- to joining Shopify, I... Uh, was the head of data for a company called Intelligent Megatronic Systems. Uh, I was, I'm also up to now an adjunct assistant professor at the University of Waterloo. Um, and yeah, I've been with Shopify now for, wow, three years, time flies. <laughs> but yeah, uh, it's been a fun ride so far. It's, uh, it's exciting and every day there's something new to do and to learn. <laughs> I think a lot of people in data science uh, often have uh, sort of deep ap- academic backgrounds um, and, and, and now you work in industry and I think a lot of people sort of think about that distinction. And is there anything you can share partly you know, based on your, you, you've spent time in academia, you've spent time uh, in industry thinking about that distinction? I think the key thing that academia like provided me um, is learning how to learn. And uh, I think this is in self is a skill set. Um, you don't have to be an academic to have it. Like there are people who acquired over years doing other stuff, but I think academia definitely facilitates like enhancement of this skill because this is exactly what you do for so many years. You're learning to learn. You're learning to learn from others' knowledge and then apply it, uh, extrapolate and traverse this knowledge um, comfortably. So. I think this is a key that academia provides is like the ability to learning to learn. And definitely this is something that becomes a superpower in uh, industry. Anybody who is able to grow in an industry role because of how fast technology changes, because how fast uh, things evolve and how fast we need to ship like meaningful products for our customers and our merchants, being able to learn and pivot and change, having this constant learner's mindset is essential. It's not limited to being an academic, but uh, this is one of the key things that you pick up <laughs> doing your grad study. So uh, that it, it helps, but it's not solely limited to. <laughs> Got it. No, that makes, uh, that makes perfect sense. Now, one thing you didn't mention, but that I also did take a note of, from your background is your interest in art. And I understand you are, uh, in addition to to the, the work you do, you're an artist. You've, in fact, sold some paintings. Um, it struck me as something fairly unique for someone with your, you know, uh, you know, set of accomplishments in the field of data. You know, data scientists and artists are not often 
uh, a congruent set. Um, something that's a bit more sort of abstract and creative versus analytical and data oriented. Um, maybe you could share a little bit about that and, and how maybe that side of your uh, personality and brain uh, helps. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, that's true. So I, I am an aspiring artist. I won't call myself an artist. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I like to paint. It's actually a very uh, therapeutic for me. And it's a way that I use the different sides of my brain. Um, I, I do acrylic on canvas and I had a few exhibits and actually few of my pieces sold. And I remember that every time somebody found like something like this happens, I would be always like, are you sure? <laughs> like, are you sure? Uh, because the data scientist in me like looks at being very pedantic about all the different things that um, <laughs> went wrong that shouldn't go wrong. And in my head, it's, um, I think what gives me an air cover is the fact that I do abstract painting. So like, it's very forgiving. Like it might, like you might be painting a dog and comes out like an airplane and people are like, oh, it's brilliant. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> uh, jokes aside, uh, I, actually, I actually think uh, data in itself, the way you think about it, the way you actually build a data narrative and a data storytelling, um, as well as the way you build visualization in itself is a form of an art. Like it's not about knowing what you need to know or slicing the data or building the engineering pipelines. It's also about taking this whole data point and like seeing it in your head in a way that builds this whole narrative and story that you can communicate to your stakeholders. So um, I actually see the two sides of my, my world like, like mapping and cross pollinating a lot. Uh, also the, the, the understanding of um, what catches the eye and how to make sure like if you have an important data point, how do you visualize it? How do you make sure that uh, you're able to communicate it? And that applies whether you're building an analytical product or even if you're building like a merchant facing product, either way, you wanna make sure that you're providing the most actionable and meaningful insights uh, to your audience. So it, it does it does map a bit, <laughs> not not too far apart. Yeah, no. It's ultimately, um, you know, much of what anyone does is about communicating. Whether you're communicating uh, through art or communicating uh, through data, and as you point out, visualization is really the intersection between the two. But I also imagine you, you talked before about this idea of the learning mindset and really being something that you drew from your academic background, something that that you find valuable in your work um, at Shopify around data science. So maybe we could dig into that a little bit more, um, you know, talking a bit about the always learning mindset. How did you, you know, which by the way, I think is a, a really uh, both useful and, and unique perspective to bring. Are there some, how did you come to think of, find it to be so important in your work? Are, are there some specific, experiences you had that, that drove this home for you? Yeah, that's a great question. So like when I think about it, um, technology keeps on evolving. Every other day there is a new library, new tool, new algorithm, um, new model, new database coming out. So with the right learning mindset, with the, with the ability to self-reflect, being humble about the things that we don't know and seeking the knowledge Helps, uh, helps sets us for success regardless what area we're working on and what's the field. With a very dynamic field like data science, this becomes a, a huge multiplier. Because like, if you think just about it, like the amount of, uh, whether it's research, the amount of new tools, the amount of new libraries, the amount of uh, best practices that keeps on coming up, it's huge. Like this is a very prime field, uh, lush and green, so there's a lot there that is happening, which is amazing for all data scientists. But with this right mindset, we can actually evolve and grow. Also, one key thing I learned very early, and as I mentioned, I started my career as a developer, uh, loving your code or loving your solutions or your product or your algorithms too much makes it a barrier for you to build the right products. 
because the truth is what's right right now is not what's right forever. So being able to pick up on uh, what can be better and be able to seek that knowledge and evolve is essential to keep building the best solutions. Um, and, and best, there's air quotes around it, of course, that's what defines best, but the best solutions for your customers and your merchants all the time, right? Like the whole point is making sure that whatever you're providing or whatever you're building is meaningful, useful, uh, and efficient. And the definitions of these things evolve over time because of technology. Having a learner's mindset involves have, having the self-awareness, the humbleness, and the ability to learn and seek knowledge that will evolve over time and will make your solutions and your products and your answers evolve over time. Yeah, I think that's a, it's a great perspective and I can certainly relate as a, a person who's thinking a lot about products, we have a tendency to, 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 yeah, to fall in love with our products, uh, which, and I think what that um, prevents is that it stops us from sort of asking uh, questioning things. Uh, and, and your point about humility is really important. And the humility, the willingness to step back and ask, you know, why do we do things that way? And, and that's something you've spoken about in the past, this idea of five levels of why. Maybe maybe you could share a little bit about that perspective. Yeah, definitely. So uh, this is something I know that my team will joke about the fact that I'm being a broken record about it. Like, uh, like, like we need to understand the five levels of why. Um, and the reason when you think about five levels is because at the first one is like, well, because that person wants it. Like, why are you doing this? That person wants it. Okay, why? Uh, well, because this is how it's done. It's like, oh, oh no, 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 let's, let's go again. Okay, why? Uh, and then the, at, at, at the fifth level, this is when you start going back to first principles. So the thing is we need to tie everything to do, we do back to first principles. And then when we think about it, we need to, uh, so just for concept, for, for context, first principles is going back to the very, very basics. Why are you doing this thing? The very basic human need that ties to it. Let's not make it uh, too sophisticated. Let's go to the first principles and then build up from there. Because when you have the very first principles very clear, every layer that you put of complexity after is taking you somewhere towards the, the solution of the problem. Um, I always say to the team, uh, well, somebody very smart one time, one time told me this and I, I've been repeating it like a broken record. A uh, solved problem is an asset. Is a, the solution is a debt. Every single solution, how, regardless how beautiful it is, how elegant it is, it's a debt. Because you need to evolve it, you need to make it better, you need to enhance it. So by, by thinking back to the first principles, you always can challenge the solution and make sure that you're always having a solved problem. And that does help a lot with technical debt and how you think about it. Um, the other thing that is important too is thinking beyond what is it now? Like I always ask is like, is the six month Ella would be grateful for the decision that I'm making now? Um, and don't get me wrong, like sometimes I throw my six month future self a lot of shit problems to solve or a lot of hard problems to solve. I, the, but it's intentional. Instead of blindly just passing the ball to my future self, I'm intentional about, okay, I know that this decision will cost me one, two or three and I can live with them. So I'm just passing them along or you know what, like, no, I should do another decision that would be too hard to, to fix or to revert. So um, go, going deep into the five levels of why, going back to the first principles and do, applying some second order thinking or even third if we can, is like what, what is actually the second or third level implications of a decision I'm making, are, all of them are essential just to make sure that whatever strategy we're building, whatever data products we're solutioning, all are able to tie it uh, to a meaningful thing that we can actually maintain for the long term. And it's not just like a band-aid uh, that feels good now, but uh, later on, we would need to rip it off and throw it away. But in, relating this back to our earlier conversation around your, your academic background, um, I've often heard, and I, I think it's true, that if you really understand something, uh, you should be able to teach somebody else. 
So like the ability to teach somebody is also, and I think that comes back to your point about first principles. If, if you truly understand something in a deep way, you understand, you know, not in a jargony level, but you actually understand it in the context of a way you could explain it to a kindergartner or to, uh, you know, someone who's not trained in data science. Is that something you've found? Yeah, that's, uh, that's actually a great point. So uh, my dad actually used to say that all the time. I think it's an Einstein quote, if I remember right. Like if, uh, if, um, if you know it now, you can explain it to a four-year-old or if, if you, or if you can't explain it to a four-year-old, you don't know it good enough, something like that. Um, so 100%, but also on a leadership level, let's think about it from a leadership level. The fact is like good, cohesive, well gelled teams are the ones who all are working towards a shared vision and the shared vision when it becomes too complicated or it doesn't tie back to the first principles or you can't answer the five levels of why this understanding of the shared vision will not be consistent across so what would happen is you would have a team that each of them running in a different way thinking they're working towards the vision so having this clarity having taking everything back to first principles talking back into like a clear why is essential to get these teams to be efficient cohesive working together to to where they need to go and you get to see that in a lot of like like i think this is this is something that I got to see over and over every time we build, for example, a data product and we productionize it. Like the key is like we need always to start with the what. What is the value? Not the algorithm. Like so easy to tie everything when you talk to um, even my, my much younger self. Uh, I will go talk about like, oh, the algorithm and I do this and I do that. Truth is, if we step back, we look at the business problem. And the business problem, for example, we were like, let's say uh, Shopify Capital. We are helping merchants get the capital they need to grow their businesses, right? So when you phrase it this way, it's understandable. And then like all the different pieces plug into this overarching vision. But when you go and talk about, uh, well, we're gonna do this for casting algorithm and we're gonna do like, don't get me wrong. All of this is very important, but all of them need to feed into the, 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 the mission and how we're helping merchants and how we're empowering them to do to, to live their dreams. So like tying, like taking it back to first principle and tying it all together does help a lot, even from a leadership level, not just from a personal building blocks into any algorithmic work. So, uh, so building on that and, and maybe thinking a little bit about the organization, I think a lot of people listening to the podcast have as their responsibility uh, either building or leading a team uh, within their company, a uh, data team within their company. And I know that's absolutely something that you've done uh, at Shopify. I think it would be fair to say Shopify is a really a data-driven organization. Um, and um, you've built a somewhat unique uh, team structure. Um, and maybe So maybe just share, how is the data science team at Shopify organized, and, and why have you chosen to organize it that way? How do you think about the, the challenge of team building in data science? Um, so before I dig into answering the question, let me give a, a, to the listeners a quick overview of what Shopify is, right? So Shopify is a commerce platform. Uh, we have the mission of uh, empowering, uh, like making commerce better for everybody. Like we exist to empower merchants to build their dreams uh, on like, and just focus on what they need to do, right? Like just making sure that they are focused on their business and we take on the the burden and the, the uh, of building the platform, making it up, making it running. So Shopify exists to make commerce better for everybody, to as, as we say in there, like power the rebels, like the, inter, the independent entrepreneurs to build their own brand and live their dreams, like literally achieve financial independence. So this is why Shopify exists. And this is our key mission. Um, talking about the data teams that I have built in Shopify. So I've been in Shopify for three years. I initially started uh, heading the data teams for Plus, which is the large uh, merchant uh, in uh, Shopify as well as international with a mission of taking Shopify to be a perfect market fit for every country out there. 
Today we're already in 175 countries, but our objective at the time, uh, or our objective up to now, of course, is making sure that uh, Shopify meets the needs, the unique needs of entrepreneurs in different regions, because it's not one size fits all. Building different teams. Uh, under these different constraints are a tad different, right? So there is a different way when you think about building a internationally distributed team from building a team that is um, working with the merchants that have the most data as well as are the most demanding because of the scale of their business. Um, so let, I, and I think when I was thinking about it, like um, I, I saw the problem as like, yeah, there's a lot of overlap, but I, think I thought about it from, some key fundamental aspects. So number one, um, in data, we uh, in data and Shopify, we are fully embedded. That means we work with every team embedded, sitting with them, living their pain, uh, seeing the wins and living the losses. Uh, and this is so I, in my opinion, this is so essential because I've worked pr prior into organizations where the data team was like a separate unit on the side or something like that. The challenge with this is uh, it becomes a handover problem and you're not living the wins. Uh, and then at this point of time, the, your five level of whys, you can't go deep enough. You don't always go to first principle because you cannot actually impact the merchant directly. There is like many layers of separation, but when you are embedded in a full product team, you're living the wins and living the losses. So at this point of time, it's the, the concepts that you're trying to move the needle on uh, can be at first principles because you're living the business problem. Uh, so we this is this is essential. So the data science and Shopify is still a uh, a craft. So we're very focused on it. It's very consistent. But then we're also embedded within all the different uh, teams. Uh, we also work with full stack data scientists. So what what does that mean? So our teams are consistent of full stack data science people who work from uh, ETL. So from the acquisition, making sure that the data is in all the way into the machine learning. We don't split the roles into sh in Shopify data into, oh, well, that's an ML engineer, or that's like an ETL engineer, or that's like, oh, an analyst or data scientist. What we do is we work across the stack. And I, I personally feel very strongly about this for a couple of reasons. It's when you split it, it's easier actually to hire. But the challenge is, Again, your workflow becomes a handover workflow. So you need somebody to build you the pipelines so that somebody does the analysis. So somebody then goes and takes that and build the machine learning model. So again, it becomes very hard to have ownership on the problem. And I value ownership a lot because when you have ownership, it's your win. Like you're working so hard to move the needle on something, but then you're also so incentivized to do this because it's your win. You are able to make a life of entrepreneurs better. Um, so what we have is we have uh, data scientists that work across the stack from acquisition all the way to the machine learning. And if you think about it, you cannot build a machine learning model without understanding the statistics of the data. And the statistics of the data come from the analytics. And for you to get the full analytics and really the full impact, sometimes you need to do experimentation or hold or something like that. So like, again, that's an optimization work that data scientists need to do. And then you can't do any of that without having the data ready in the database. So again, so it's all interdependent. So when you have control over your pipeline, you actually have more autonomy and you can have bigger impact. Um, and I also found that full stack data scientists and to, tend to work much closer to engineers, to Xers and PMs, because again, they all are working towards the same mission versus a handover phase. Oh, well, I, my, my accuracy on my Python is 99. You're the one who didn't implement it right into production. We don't have these discussions. We're like, oh, it's not right. Okay, let's fix it. So and I think this is a mindset that I value a lot and I think it does have the right impact uh, on the business and the teams. So let's dig into, you make this point about uh, these really unified teams and sort of the tight integration um, with the product. I think that's really interesting and, and, and very valuable for listeners. But I imagine that also makes things challenging when it comes to recruiting. So how do you think about what are the sort of the key traits you're looking for 
maybe you know hard skills, but also soft skills that you that you look for when you try to recruit, build your team. Yeah, that's a great question. I I chat with that a lot with 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 my team as well as my peers. So um, of course, hard skills. Um, this is sort of becoming more of a standard thing now in in the industry. So of course, we're always looking for strong Python, strong developers, because we work uh, uh, across the stack. So like just Python as a scripting tool on the side is good, but building production code is very useful. Um, or, and it's a key skill that we actually in, interview for. Uh, being able to have this um, strong understanding of metrics, of algorithmic work, of uh, ML models like is, is again essential. We work with Scala, with uh, Python, uh, we worked on Preston, BigQuery, um, and just having understanding of all of this and how the ecosystem works is, is great. But I think the thing that is unique to and we're, we, we're very keen about is like some of the soft skills. So I always say I hire on the three H's, which is humble, honest, and hardworking. Um, and I know that's a simplifier, but I think they all tie into each other. Uh, and of course, it's not the only thing, but like humble and honest is like being able to be self-aware uh, and uh, be able to seek knowledge, seek feedback, want to work with others, build like I'm a big believer in collective intelligence. Like I think I'm smarter by everybody I talk to. I'm not smart on my own and I don't think anybody is. I think we're all smarter together as a collective and the strength is in the collective more than the individual. Of course, the individual component, like it feeds into each other, but we're stronger together. So being humble, honest and hardworking is essential things uh, from soft skill, being able to, uh, again, think, have this deep thinking of the business, uh, the business case or the why, uh, making sure that they have a high ownership. All of these are key things that are essential that when I am interviewing somebody, I keep in mind and make sure like um, to have the discussion on uh, on them. So this issue of, uh, by the way, I think those uh, humble, honest, and uh, hardworking are uh, really excellent criteria, something people should take a note of. Uh, but this issue of honesty uh, is, is a challenging one because um, being honest, especially as it relates to data science, can can be very difficult. It, it puts your team and in in, in in potentially you in the position of having to challenge uh, the conventional wisdom inside an organization. You know, we've you, and you started our conversation you know, thinking about the way we've always done things, right? And and sometimes or I would suspect often, you find that the data tells you something different. It causes you to challenge the way people have often thought about it. Maybe there's something you could share that would be uh, illuminating for the for listeners. Sure. So I can share a story that just recently happened. So I lead the growth data team. And I know growth it might not always be a known thing. So what we are focused on is making sure that m- like merchants who are interested in joining Shopify can join Shopify in the most seamless way. And we're setting them up for success. So it's not just uh, making it easier for them to join. It's also making sure that they are activated and they are, are set on a path for success, uh, building their businesses and their dreams. So growth in itself has multiple facets. So has the acquisition part, which is a marketing aspect, but also has a very strong product and engineering side, which is like uh, at every point of the interaction, how can we make sure that it's easier, it's smoother, uh, and how do we make sure that they are able to join Shopify and get the information they need right away, know what tools to install, know, like just make their onboarding journey much, much better. So it, it does have the multiple aspects. So it has a very business front-facing teams. It has um, a very strong engineering and product side. Uh, and is very dependent on data, which is awesome. So this combo is great. So one thing that we have just done, we have done an analysis to understand what's the impact of the different channels and different behaviors on our retained merchants. So 
of course, everybody's baby is the most beautiful baby, including mine. Like, I love my babies, right? <laughs> uh, but the truth is, not everything behaves similarly, right? There, there is varying impact of the different channels, for example. So um, if, if, if we're considering uh, Facebook versus AdWords versus Instagram, like all of these are different tools and uh, people interact with them differently. And accordingly, when merchants come in, they, they go through different flows, but then the flows merge and they tend to behave differently on the platform. So we have done a deep dive, a, a, actually a large deep dive to understand what's these behaviors. And based on that, we had really good discussions with uh, our peers on like, what's the impact of these different channels and what's the impact of the spend on these and what's the ROI. And we, we had a lot of, and, and what's the action that lead to retention, right? Like we need to, these mentions staying on our platform and being successful. Um, so the key here was coming in with, key with important questions. It's like, hey, we observed that in data and this is what, what, what we believe is happening. What do you think is happening? So it's also, and this is where humbleness comes in because the truth is it's so easy. There is confirmation biases, right? Like you could, you can trip yourself in a confirmation bias. I think this channel is not good and I see something um, must be not good, but there is data issues. There is incomplete data or incomplete context too, right? The data lives within a context. Um, so coming in with the right questions and again, asking the five levels of why, which is like, why do you think this is happening? Oh, okay, so that, but why do you think that thing that you just mentioned is happening? So as you dig deeper, actually everybody becomes way more aligned, even if you're challenging the status quo, because at the end of the day, again, we're all working towards the same mission. Uh, one key thing that I actually highly, highly value at Shopify is it's like, all companies say we're mission driven, but the truth is every single human in Shopify lives and breathes the Shopify mission, which is making entrepreneur like commerce better for everybody, like literally bending the curve for entrepreneurs. Um, so we all live it. And now as soon as you start talking with like, well, we don't think this is the best way to bend the curve, you find people who are like, oh, you know what, maybe maybe you can pivot in that way, maybe you can do it this way. So because we, again, take it back to first principles, which is where we're heading and where, where we wanna go and go in with humbleness and openness to hear because we're not going in like, uh, we always say strong opinions weekly held. So we go in and like, this is what we observe, the why of it. People become more open to have the conversation. And at this point of time, we converge to a better direction together. So yeah, that's that's a most recent example that came top of mind. So that's a great example. So let's talk a little bit about Shopify, which is which is growing incredibly quickly. So I think it'd be fair to call it a hyper growth company, um, and that is that sort of presents in itself the, the simple growth problem is a is itself a problem. Um, so how is the the data team? Uh, growing and, and how is it responding to, you know, sort of the changing environment at Shopify as the, as the company gets bigger, as, as you as you hopefully achieve that uh, aspirational mission? Yeah, so um, that's, that's a great question. Uh, so just to give a little bit of context, so uh, the GMB that was uh, traded over shop uh, on Shopify was over 230 billion in total sales by our merchants uh, last year. Uh, that that's huge, um, and like we have over 300 million customers around the globe have purchased from Shopify merchants in 2019 uh, from 2019 alone. Um, 300 million. That's again like ma massive. Um, so definitely Shopify has been growing very fast, and data is a key superpower that like. Shopify tries to use across all its products and all our our solutions. 
we have been heavily recruiting. We have been, again, relying on brilliant people who own the problem end to end using full stack data science. Uh, we hire people with high ownership so they can hop in and roll the sleeves. And some, just to give context, like some of the products that we ship that is like uh, data driven and uh, ML, uh, 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 data informed and ML driven is something like Shopify Capital. So Shopify Capital, if you don't know, is like, uh, extending loans to merchants to build them. And at this moment, like we, we hit a milestone of um, a quarter of a billion dollars. Uh, that's as of September uh, 30th, 2020. Um, we have another thing that's called Shop Pay, uh, which is an app where like uh, people can uh, see their purchases, track it, uh, make reorders. Uh, and we have over 14 billion uh, in lifetime GMV. Uh, which is gross merchant value, which is like all the sales that happened on it. And over 60 million shoppers opted in at the end of last quarter, like Q3. Um, so like, again, we have, our scale is growing and our like merchants are coming and growing. So I don't know, I, to give you another example that I think is cool is uh, Gymshark. So Jim, I don't know. Do you know Gymshark? It's like activewear. Okay, so Gymshark is an activewear company that is based in, uh, started in the UK, and it's a global brand now. And it's it's amazing. Started from a small merchant, like just like making some activewear, all the way to this big ginormous global merchant worldwide. And all of it happened on Shopify. So it's just like heartwarming to see like small merchants like starting their business out of their garages or out of like their dining room tables and then growing to the, this massive large scale um so yeah definitely the scale has been huge uh, and, the, and the growth and the rate by which the growth is is huge but i think what what may it's also a super fun ride for all honesty <laughs> um because it's a good mission. It's one of the very few missions that also is aligned with like, it has a good economical impact on, on countries. Uh, it has a good uh, impact on mer and merchants themselves, right? They're reaching um, uh, financial independence as well as it's a good option for buyers because it gives them di diversity of options to opt in. So all of that, in addition to uh, how like, the, the scale and the impact, as well as how data-driven and how honest and humble and great people are at the company. It's been, been crazy, but it's been a fun ride. <laughs> so, and, and your example of a UK company uh, leads us to what I think is a, another interesting topic, which is Shopify is going international um, and, and really thinking about uh, a global push. Has that had any impact from a data perspective and how you've thought about building uh, and answering data questions? Oh, 100%. Uh, so Shopify is already in 175 countries, over 175 countries. Uh, the global push was to make sure that we are a great market fit. And I think this is where the data becomes interesting. So for example, North America is very credit card heavy and it's so easy to assume, oh, well, all first world countries are credit card heavy. Well, it's easy. No, that's actually not true. Like if you look at it, uh, you would have, uh, for example, Germany, they appreciate like direct pay. They have like similar to in Canada, they have like e-transfers or something like that. Um, in, in, in most of the world, actually cash is king still. Uh, so like assumptions get challenged. So, so again, as I mentioned, data lives in a context. And it's important to understand the context around the data to be able to understand the trends, the patterns, and what you're building for. And the more you dig into the different needs, uh, unique needs and requirements of each country, you find actually there's a lot of differences. So, for example, interactions with um, an online platform might be totally different based on colors, because in cer certain cultures, colors have very, very particular meaning and carry a lot of uh, weight. So accordingly, choices of colors are important and interactions with websites and with stores might differ based on that. Um, other, again, context is key for everything. Uh, then you have like global platforms that we're not heavily using. So for example, WeChat is a key, key platform in the APAC region that is very heavily used, but it's 
pre presence in North America, of course, is present, but it's not as heavy or as large or not as ubiquitous um, as in uh, APAC. And there's WePay, there is like Baidu as a primary search search engine. So the as you dig into the different uh, different regions, there is also unique needs, whether it's um, selling needs, whether it's um, interface uh, look and feel needs to the platform, whether it's also onboarding needs. So for example, Japan is a very high touch country. So like you can have everything automated, but they do value having the conversation. So having like certain type of support available is different. So again, um, as we go, as we invest more in the different global markets, uh, we, from a data side, we have learned a lot as we put more context and we have amazing in-country teams that help us collect that in context as well as like we have now data teams embedded globally. Um, just having that additional context around the data makes us understand what's happening so much more and build much better products for our merchants globally because we understand how they're interacting with it. Fantastic. So, uh, well, uh, we're coming up on time, and, and I just want to thank you for uh, amazing insights. I mean, Shopify sounds like both an amazing uh, company, a great mission, uh, high growth, and, and it sounds like the, the data science team is really at the center of that. So when we think about this broad theme of creating the data-driven enterprise, and at its core, I think every business ultimately is a data business. Uh, I think it's fair to say Shopify typifies that as really the, the, an exemplar, and you're really at the center of that. So congratulations on remarkable work. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. It was great chatting with you. It was a lot of fun. Thank you.